Hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, along with my wonderful wife, Janet, and we are streaming live from the Team Needham Abode podcast studio. And we are super excited. We're on a little early today. We're so excited to have Evan Transu back on. He was actually on Monday, and um, it worked out that we could have him on again this week. Um, so he did a, we're doing an early show for to accommodate our guests. And I'm super excited. We could have kept talking for much longer Monday um, because Evan and I are on the same playing field in so many ways. And today, um, we hit on it Monday just a little bit, but today we're going to hit more on um, food sensitivities. And it's something I'm really interested in and a lot of people are interested in. It's uh, become a, I'm not going to say a hot topic maybe, but more of a popular topic over the last few years um, because there is so many people with food sensitivities. So we're going to be talking about about elimination diets and and testing for food sensitivities and and adding those foods back in and if you're always sensitive to them and all kinds of good stuff. So Evan, without further ado, welcome to our show. Hey, it's good to be back so soon. And um, yeah, thank you for working with me for the time. It was kind of funny because the other day when I said, I'm like, oh, I got the schedule from here to here. And then I didn't expect Sean to be like, okay, cool. Let's do 9 a.m. I'm like, all right. Let's do that. Like, because that's for, for you guys. I knew that was even earlier. So that's why I didn't expect it. But I'm always down. So thanks for having me back. Yeah, we, we really appreciate it, Phil, Phil, this time slot. And it, it's a subject that's we've never had on our podcast before. And, um, you know, we talk everything, health and wellness. And food sensitivity is a, is a big part of that. Um, diet is you know, as we talk about many times, is is more is one of the most important things we can do to stay healthy. Um, as we talked about Monday, and um, so food sensitivities falls into that. So, tell us a little bit about your introduce yourself a little bit quickly, and then we'll uh, we'll get into more of the meat and potatoes of food. The meat and potatoes, no pun intended, <laughs> for food sensitivities. <laughs> yeah, I'll, de- I'll definitely do that quickly because obviously they could listen to the other thing and, and hear the in-depth story because that's yeah. really why we didn't get to a lot of this stuff the other day. We were kind of going back and forth, and it was very fun. Um, but yeah, no, my name is Evan Transu. I started dealing with health issues at five years old. A uh, little mental, a lot more physical at the time. But by the age of 18, these things progressed to the point of I had seven different diagnosed conditions, and one of them I was told was incurable. Thankfully, I don't have any of them anymore. Anymore, including the quote unquote incurable one, which is amazing. And how I was able to do that was really looking into natural medicine, understanding that the seven different conditions that I was going to different specialists for were not disconnected. They were actually all intimately connected. And if I was able to figure out the solution to one, most likely I'd be able to figure out the solution to the others. So I was able to do that um, largely because of my work with functional diagnostic nutrition. I went through their program. And when you go through it, you get labs for yourself. So you get to work on your own health while becoming a practitioner. Uh, that's pretty much all I needed. It was perfect. Um, it's helped myself, my mom, and it led me to where I'm at today. So that's the brief background. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about one of the things you do um, with the functional diagnostic um, nutrition is you do food sensitivity testing, correct? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So just to be clear then too, for the audience, if they're not familiar, FDN, Biz Reed, Davis, the founder, would kill me if I didn't say this. So the system that we use at FDN is something that he came up with after working with over 10,000 people. This is actually true. It was over 10 years, 10,000 people. It was crazy. And so he found that because there's so many labs out there, right? Like it's really fancy Mm -hmm. stuff can be out there. So what he found was even if someone has all the money in the world, you're almost getting like a law of diminishing returns by just running everything. So Mm -hmm. what can we run that is a great foundation for every single person? every single time. And in the six tests that he does that with, which we touched on briefly uh, last time, food sensitivities is one of them. So although we'll be focusing on that today, uh, just know that an FDN practitioner, generally speaking, wouldn't really be recommending that as a standalone ever. It's in uh, in conjunction with all these other things. And we'll get to that soon because it actually makes a lot of sense with what that other guest had said on your podcast, I think a few weeks ago, Sean, when they said, well, hey, if you heal the gut, the food sensitivities aren't as big of a problem. So we agree right. with that. And that's where this will all connect and make sense. Yeah. And by the way, uh, we did interview uh, Reed Davis. So um, go check out and search in if anybody um, wants more information about Reed Davis and the start, how he started the program. Um, go in and search on our podcast channel or our YouTube channel and search under Reed Davis and you can find him. So, um, yeah, so exactly, 
you know, do you do the same food sensitivity panel for everybody? And and what do you start with and how many and 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 all the details of that? Okay, great question. So uh no, and I think the reason that it's no is because we need to kind of like, hey, let's define this and explain this just in case someone doesn't fully get this, right? So there's a difference between food allergies, food sensitivities, and food intolerances. And the sensitivities and intolerances, even in the natural space, it's hilarious, still confuses people. So an allergy, guys, is always going to be defined as an, an immune reaction that comes from IgE, which stands for immunoglobulin E. And this isn't always these types of people, but you can think about the type of people that if you were in school and there was kids at the peanut table or you have a kid in school now and they have like a whole separate peanut table where uh, it's peanut free, no one else can sit there and eat their lunch there. That is always an IgE reaction. That's never a food sensitivity. That is an allergy. Anytime you hear about the anaphylaxis or they got to go to the hospital right away because they could pass away if they don't get help, uh, that's an allergy. So it's one specific type of uh, immune response, which is IgE. Food sensitivities are a little more complicated. And this is why we, we generally recommend one test, but we do look at some others as well in specific circumstances. So food sensitivities, you can almost think of any immune reaction that's not IgE. And that's why I think this part of testing got downplayed for a while by Western medicine, because I actually agree with them downplaying it when it first came out, because it's like, all right, what's the sensitivity? Anything that's not an allergy. That's pretty broad. There's like hundreds, if not thousands of ways, because we're still discovering other ways, that the body can react to it a f uh, food immunologically. So we're like, all right, how do we actually test for all of this practically? And we couldn't starting out. We can now. But what happened is first, uh, I believe it was the ELISA, which is an IgG test. So if you figured out immunoglobulin E, then you already know what this one is. It's immunoglobulin G. And what's tricky about immunoglobulin G is if, you know, let's say, Sean or Janet, you guys had an IgG response to tomatoes. The problem with IgG is that you could eat that tomato today and three days later have a headache. It's a delayed response. Whereas IgE, if you were allergic to tomatoes, you're going to know something's wrong very quickly. I think like the max it could be is a few hours, but you're generally speaking going to know something happened. So IgG is going to be this delayed response. Um, there's a lot of false positives. There's a lot of fa false negatives. So it didn't get the respect uh, really that you know, food sensitivity should have. So we'll touch on that more in a second. But then food intolerances, this one's super simple, but people get this mixed up because they assume a sensitivity must be, oh, my stomach hurts. Your stomach may never hurt for a food sensitivity or even an allergy. And intolerance means that you can't tolerate it. And the most common example is a lactose intolerance, right? Yeah. You need the enzyme lactase. You being or having digestive distress because of lactose does not imply any immune response whatsoever. It could be that too, because you can have these things overlapped in theory, but intolerance does not imply a sensitivity or an allergy. Um, it means that, hey, this isn't sitting so well, I'm not digesting this properly. So um, that's kind of the differences. And then to answer your question about the specific test, there are other tests that we use, but the main one that we recommend in FDN for our Canadian practitioners and United States-based practitioners, because it's only available in these two countries, is the patented mediator release test. So remember, I just said one of the problems historically with food sensitivity testing is the fact that you can only look at one thing out of hundreds, if not thousands of ways that the body can react. IgG, IgE, IgA, all these things are called mediators. So the one test that came out is called the MRT, it stands for the mediator release test. So these guys are at Oxford Biomedical Labs down in West Palm, Florida. Love them. Um, they're, they're wonderful people. They actually, if you run their test and you're local to them in Florida, they let you run it at their lab and they will give you a tour of the facility. I had one of my clients do that. He called me up. He thought I was the best thing ever because <laughs> like, I didn't know they were going to do that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so, yeah, that is cool. Yeah. Um, so they, they were showing them the tech and stuff, but what they said is, wait a second. If there's hundreds, if not thousands of ways that the body can react with these mediators and IgG testing already costs like 130 to 200 something dollars, depending on how many foods you're running. If every single one is going to cost this amount of money, what if we just figured out, wait, where are the mediators coming from to begin with? It's the white blood cell. And so the white blood cell releases the mediators. So what's fascinating about their test, Sean and Janet, is that they don't look at IgG, IgE, or any of these things specifically, what they patented is the process of measuring volumetric changes in the white blood cell. So at first, this isn't going to work because you have to do the data to correlate this with symptoms. But now what they've been able to do 
Um, first of all, it's very clinically backed. All their science is on nowleap.com. So you can check that out and all the science is there. But they have a very high um, specificity rate and the replica, uh, replicability rate is 93.6%. So this is one of those tests that actually gets better as time goes on because they realize how much change in the white blood cell actually is indicative of an immune response. So it's color coded like food, other food sensitivity tests. Green would generally be safe. Generally um, yellow is going to be like, Hey, watch out for this. And red's like, Hey, whoa, 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 no go for a little bit. So we can't tell you when you run this test, if you had an IgE response, I can't tell you if it was IgG. I have no idea how you're reacting. What I can tell you is you are reacting to this food. And what's nice about this one is like when you do an IgG test, sometimes people remove the foods. So like, okay, I didn't feel anything. What's going on? I have never had a client yet in six years do this test um, and not see improvement. Some is incredibly extreme, like in, in a good way. Others, it's a little more subtle, but all of them notice something. So that's kind of a, a good way to at least get this started foundationally here today. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jan, do you have any questions for Evan on that? That's really fascinating because I just had somebody come back with a test that, you know, they had lower... IGA. And I'm like, well, why would that happen? And, you know, we started looking at it and really it was because they were under stress. Mm. So, um, our physical position of having, you know, chronic stress really can change how we can absorb our nutrients and how those nutrients affect us. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, they're, they're both tied together. So, um, I guess where I'm going is which, which one of the problems is causing this because is it their lifestyle that's causing all the stress and then then they add the food or is it the food causing the stress? Well, this is a great question. I love what you just said about the IGA thing because uh, it's a separate test, but we run a stool test uh, in FDN so called the GI map by DSL. And there's one marker on there called anti-gliadin IgA. Now it's right under secretory IgA. So you're absolutely correct. If someone's been under chronic stress, we can actually see that secretory IgA being below reference range. And this is where we're, we call ourselves like health detectives rather than just Western medicine or health coaches, because we start thinking outside the box. And this is a simple example, but we go, okay, wait a second. If secretory IgA is low, we know it takes years for that to get there, generally speaking. If it's low and anti-gliadin is already like middle of the ground, is it not fair to say that that IgA response wouldn't have been higher if this person's secretory IgA wasn't higher? So that's very, it's kind of astute thinking to say like, okay, they're under chronic stress. This is why this is happening. I agree with that. So then to answer your specific question about how does this all tie into the stress thing, this is why... I, I validated what that guest said on your show um, several weeks back, Sean, when they talked about how do food sensitivities even matter? Do they even exist, right? This is why I don't like screwing around with random tests, because I do believe the MRT, it's so good that it actually accelerates the healing fast enough in the client that it's worth it. But at the end of the day, the food sensitivity happens when these food proteins are getting into our bloodstream and our body can actually create an immune response. So I don't mean to sound like um, so cliche because everyone always comes back down to the leaky gut thing. I don't I don't like to overuse that or oversimplify that. But in this case, leaky gut's one of the, the main contributors here. Because as those uh, tight junctions become more permeable in the small intestine, it allows the food proteins to get through into the bloodstream. Now, worse yet, too, if your gut's leaky, you probably already have compromised digestion. That was probably preceding the leaky gut. So you really got some decent-sized proteins, still microscopic, of course, but relatively decent-sized proteins getting directly into the bloodstream. When it does that the body says, whoa, 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 we, we can't have this. This isn't supposed to be here. And the body's correct. Where it's incorrect is that it doesn't need to create such a massive response. But we always have to remember in holistic health, the body's always doing the right thing. It always is doing the right thing that it knows to do. So it sees foreign invader. It could be the proteins in a damn avocado, right? A supposed superfood. But yeah. it sees those proteins in there, says, whoa, 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 this is bad. And it starts creating that immune response. So it almost sends out like these army guys just to start shooting at, at that food. And it almost gets tagged if you eat it enough. So now you've got an army specific sometimes to the food protein that you're reacting to. And yeah, that chronic stress, now it's a, now it's a cascade. Because the chronic stress might have led to the leaky gut, which led to the development of the food sensitivity, Janet, right? But now the issue is you're sensitive to the food. So every time you consume that, you're worsening 
an immune response, which is creating more stress on the body. So this is why still to this day, so long as there are tests out there like the MRT, um, we very much stand by, and, and I do clinically after six years of doing this, I stand by the food sensitivity test being worth it, especially if they're not willing to make dietary changes because some people need to see the objective data before they're willing to uh, change anything. But I, I like those tests because I know it's the difference between healing in six months versus three months. We can have you feeling better because now we've We've taken away fuel from the fire. So do you have to do food sensitivity testing to heal? No, you do not. Does it greatly accelerate things? Yes, it does if it's the right test. So, you know, my uh, comment, you know, just thinking through this, and I I, I always learned that I appreciate all, all this information, and I always learn so much in our podcast. It's, you know, you and I were talking about uh, before the show, I'm going to I'm going to reveal some some secrets you might not want people to know, but you and I basically is, admitted that we don't watch regular podcasts. <laughs> we don't watch podcasts regularly. And one of the reasons I don't is because I've got two a week where I've got guests like yourself on where I learn things constantly. So that's the podcast I watch. Um, anyway, you know, just thinking about this and thinking about food sensitivities in general and even food allergies. And, you know, I'll go back to the peanut one. <clears throat> um, you know, when Janet and I were, in elementary school many years ago, much before you were born. Um, mm. we, <laughs> Stop saying that. <laughs> um, th there was one kid in a K through 12 school that had a peanut allergy. And, and now there's, I don't know what the numbers are, but there's considerably wow. more. Mm. And, you know, I wonder if, you know, a, a sensitivity starts at a food allergy starts out as a sensitivity and then it goes into full-blown allergy. I just wonder about these foods is like, you know, um, that we've been eating mostly for, you know, millennia. Mm -hmm. um, why all of a sudden would we be sensitive to it? I mean, in theory, we shouldn't be sensitive to most any of it um, because we've been eating it for millennia. So that must indicate that our immune system isn't healthy in the first place. You got a comment on that? Yeah. And so I will always specify this. What I would, because that's really interesting thought process. What I'm about to say is theoretical. I'm not, I can't prove this. This is my thought process behind it. So one, I mean, maybe this isn't so theoretical. We obviously know that the leaky gut thing is way worse than ever before. And if that's a main contributor to food sensitivities and allergies, which we, we do know that part, then fair enough. That could be why this is developing. But I also think it's a little bit more than that. So I, I am not well read in this space, uh, this part I'm about to say. I, I'm into functional medicine. I've never gotten deep into this. I do believe that there's validity to the idea that some of the, the filler ingredients and the things that we add to um, childhood vaccines, like egg protein can sometimes be in sometimes be in there. And there are many reports of people getting the vaccine and then developing an egg allergy. No, I'm not, this isn't an anti-vaccine thing. What I'm saying is, when you inject something that you are, I mean, the whole reason for a vaccine is to trigger an immune response. That's that's the right. point. Exactly. And so right. if we put that into your body with a bunch of other things, some of which include proteins that you might consume regularly as part of a normal American diet like eggs, would it be so far-fetched to assume that the body couldn't say, we're going to attack all of this stuff that just came in? Hmm. I don't think so. I also think glyphosate is a big reason for this. The body most likely looks at glyphosate as a huge toxin and something that needs to be addressed. And since our food's doused with it, I think a lot of people react to that as well. I actually believe that's one of the reasons many people, I'm about to go to, a, I'm traveling internationally for the first time in August. I'm going to go to Italy and Greece. Now I have a, a gluten sensitivity. I know that measure. That's not a thought. I've measured that, saw the immune response. I cannot tell you guys how many of our colleagues and practitioners will end up in the hospital if they eat gluten here in America? And I'm talking organic, organic wheat, and they still end up in the hospital. Then they have told me they go to Italy or these other countries in Europe and they can eat it all week, no problem, and not have an issue. I, I think the chemicals, I think the chronic stress, I think all of these things are leading us to react to some of these foods in ways that we shouldn't because you're right this wasn't a thing i mean even when i was a kid the peanut thing was just becoming a thing like there was like two kids that sat there um you know I, i've done some work in schools and like when you see these things now it's like it's huge you got like half the school at the peanut table I i'm kidding but yeah. you know it's a lot of kids yeah. and so you have to be able to acknowledge that something's going the wrong way if this is because an allergy 
You could say food sensitivities didn't get diagnosed properly. That's fine. You're not missing an allergy. Like you would have known that if the kid's yeah. in anaphylaxis or not. So it's legitimately happening more. Yeah. And I, I another thing it might be too, and I, I was discussing this with a, a functional medicine. She's actually a physician assistant um, earlier this week is that, you know, our food, you already talked about glycosate and that's um, for, for listeners and viewers that don't know, that's what the active ingredient Roundup. And that's been used for many decades to prevent weed growth in our foods. Um, but our food is grow is maybe different genetically modified mm -hmm. and wheat is different than it used to be. Um, you know, I've, and I don't know the details of this. I've just been told this, um, Dr. J Duke Johnson, he's a functional medicine um, doctor that's written a book on, on these subjects. Mm -hmm. And he taught, he was telling me about, Oh, the wheat germ or something is different than it used to be. And that's what we amount immune response to. And so, you know, the food is just, the food is actually different. Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually, so to to bring that back to the Europe thing, because it's like, why are these differences happening? So if I'm not mistaken, one of the things that actually happened there is in certain parts of Europe, it actually might be a whole different strain of wheat. So it might be slightly different. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the GMO thing is also a lot different in Europe. That was actually the first health topic I ever got into. I was 16 years old. Um, I was not in the best place in my life or qualified to be talking about health per se. I was, as we talked about last time, I was kind of in a mental health thing, using drugs, unfortunately, but I started studying this stuff back then, believe it or not. And so Monsanto and the GMO crisis was the first thing I got into. And yeah, when you modify the genetic structure of a food, the idea that we couldn't be sensitive to it for that reason uh, is ridiculous. Of course we could. And yeah. Europe not only has bans on this stuff in many of the countries, they at least require labeling or their food is very minimally genetically modified. People don't get it in the USA. Like we don't require labels on this stuff. It's certainly not banned. Um, it's in a lot of foods that people consume on a regular basis. And, and we don't always get that other countries don't do this, you know, um, and I'm someone who loves the United States. I'm very thankful to be here because we can have conversations like this and, and get better even where we failed, but where we need to also acknowledge that like some people will just say, oh, it's the best thing ever. It's like, guys, there's like third world countries that don't allow GMOs. Like, you know, like yeah. literally that's true. Um, so we've really failed in the healthcare side um, and we're getting better at that, I think. But that's um, that's something to consider too. I like that you brought up the GMO thing. So it, it matters. And that ties in with the glyphosate anyway, because a lot of this stuff, all of it's the same company. It's Monsanto that's under bear now. And so you know, they have these GMO foods so that they can spray it with the glyphosate. They're genetically modifying wheat so that it can survive glyphosate so that we can sell it to you, even though it's a known carcinogen at this point. Right. And, Amazing. you know, it, I, that even brings me back to, you know, my my background, you know, my my folks had a farm. And so we, we drank raw milk. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying that from the safety perspective of masses of people that 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 can work. But if you think about what happens in pasteurization of your milk and alone, I mean, it takes out bacteria that, you know, it takes out a lot of nutrients that are things that aren't normally there that has been changed over time, you know? And, and I thought it was strange when I met Sean that he had intolerances and, you know, I just drank raw milk. And yeah. so never had a problem, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, so there's changes to our food, I guess, where I'm going with this is not just about raw milk. I'm just that those changes over time can make some big differences in how we are responding to what we're consuming. Definitely. I, I agree. And um, I was telling Sean the other day, we're lucky over here. We're one of the 11 states that allows you to sell raw milk directly in the store. So we don't even have to go to a farm. We can go up to um, this health food store over in my area and they got gallons of raw milk. They got raw goat milk. It's really cool. And so they buy it from the farmers that are local and then they just sell it mm -hmm. in the store for convenience. So it's cool. You kind of support two places at once. But yeah, we've taken that away. And then the worst part is when we domesticate humans as we have, the issue is if you're not healthy and then you go out and do some of this raw stuff, those people really might get sick. Now we were never right. supposed to get sick from it most likely, yeah. but then so they say, true. Oh, look, no, this is bad. This is dangerous. It's like, well, if you never equip someone their entire life to be able to handle this stuff, yeah, you have a weakened immune system. That's the issue. So I'm not, I'm not recommending this to people. This is just my personal thing. Um, but I eat actually 
that smoothie that I was drinking before, this always has four raw eggs in it. Um, so we get the pasture-raised ones right from the farm. It's all like the uncategorized stuff. So it's it's nice farm. And um, yeah, I use raw eggs in that. So I've probably eaten, if you count my smoothies, I've probably eaten a little over two, 3,000 uh, raw eggs in my life. And I'm still here, never gotten salmonella. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Build that immunity. Now, I wouldn't have done that personally in my sickest phase. I waited till I got right. a little bit better and I, I got some gut stuff under control. But now we have to, once we get to a least stable part of health, we need to start rebuilding then and letting our body get exposed to some things that it would have before. Um, I mean, to your point, Janet, there's a whole studies on showing that autoimmunity is significantly higher in countries that have access to sanitation. Um, and it's bittersweet because sanitation has also been very shown to be the reason that we don't have a lot of serious bacterial diseases anymore. So right. it, it's all it's all a balance game, right? Because there's pros and cons to everything. And it's just trying to get the best of both worlds to the ability that we're able well, a perfect example of this is, you know, how your body responds to different microbes depending on your environment. Mm -hmm. Perfect example of this is, you know, when Americans go down to Mexico, we're told to not drink the water. But, you know, the locals are exposed to that water all the time and they don't get sick. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, or I think about this too is, um, you know, I remember when we had a, a great dog, his name was Scruffy, and he would drink any kind of water, unlike the first dog we ever had. She wouldn't drink anything besides fresh tap water. <laughs> but he, And I thought, you know, how can dogs drink out of the nastiest stuff and never get sick? Oh. Well, because they have a healthy immune system, that's why. And you got to think, you know, the exposure to in, in raw eggs or in raw milk, the, the, the microbes that are in there, things that we don't even know to look for that are in there maybe you know not necessarily certainly a full microbe like a bacterium or something but maybe just a protein from a you know from an endotoxin or something like that from a bacteria or just a cell wall piece of it where our body actually you know we talked about proteins mountain immune responses from iga or ige well if you're exposed to those and your body's seen stuff like that before it can it can maybe look at things instead of being too foreign and <clears throat> amount of a, a bad immune response and just protecting your body the way it's supposed to instead of it being a sensitivity or an intolerance or even a full-blown allergy well that's what you just said is the whole mech it's kind of ironic that because again i don't I, i've never studied enough with the vaccine thing to come one way or another because you know how that's like religion in medicine. You can't, it's one way or the other, you can't talk about it. But so I'm just coming from a surface level understanding. I mean, that's how vaccines work. So it is always interesting to me that the people that you, you'd you think you'd be for both or none, because if you're for both, assuming that, right, there's not a lot of fillers and, and crazy crap, like basically a vaccine's activating the immune system so that we can yeah. No, oh, if I see measles again, here's what I do, right? Now, again, should we be putting all the other crap into the vaccine? I definitely disagree with that. But it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, if you have raw milk, if you have raw eggs from day one, if the kid's rolling around in the dirt and, and think about it, kids do this naturally and then we clean them up and stop them. If you put a baby out in the backyard, it's going to eat the dirt, it's going to do this, and now the poor thing can't even do it because it's doused with glyphosate um, so that you don't have any weeds in your backyard, right? <laughs> but um, like that, that's what we do. That's just how we are. And we're actually doing the right thing. We're getting exposed to all this stuff from pretty much day one. Uh, but then, you know, it goes both ways because this is something I never not consider. I, I think this might have come up interestingly on, I don't know if this was another podcast or what we just did the other day. I never knew this until several years ago, but the child mortality rate in the early 1800s in America was 50% by age four, meaning 50% of kids did not make it to age four in America just 200 years ago. And so then it gets really tough because it's like, Clearly, this world is dangerous to humans at some point. Like, it, we really, we really do have some trouble interacting with our environment. And Mother Nature's brutal, right? It's it is survival of the fittest. So, uh, that's always a, a an interesting and kind of it's a humbling thing to realize too, because I know that we're supposed to be getting exposed. I agree with that, and I expose myself voluntarily almost every day um, with certain probiotics and raw uh, uh, food products. But at the same time, we also know that like. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people died because of what we have in our environment. Like it's brutal out there. So I don't know where the line gets drawn yet. I think maybe, maybe the best bet is to like make it through 
um, being an infant and then try to expose these things to yourself over time. Because like, I know for me how sick I was as a kid. I'm like, if they started giving me raw everything and, and letting me get exposed to bacteria, I might not have made it. I have no idea, right? Like I was on 20 courses of antibiotics as it was uh, before the age of 18. So I don't know where the line gets drawn yet. I'm just... I'm exploring ideas right now. I'm not. Yeah. And, you know, especially over the last three years, we talk about the vaccine thing and Mm. vaccine preventable disease and all that. Um, You know, it's made me think a lot, too. But let's go back to the infant, the infants dying um, years ago. Do I think that it might have been due to sanitation? Sure. It could definitely have been. And, and, you know, there. Modern day plumbing sanitation has has saved more lives from infectious disease and, and probably actually saved more lives than anything ever. More than antibiotics, more than vaccines. There is absolutely no way that any drug, um, vaccine, antibiotics could save more lives than modern day plumbing. In third world countries, you still look at you know the number one killers, and it's you know it's cholera, it's um, you know, dysentery. It's, it's, you know, things that are in their water supplies because their water supplies aren't clean. Mm -hmm. So, but back to, back to the infants dying, um, it probably was due to um, some kind of bacterial induced diarrhea that, you know, um, dehydrated them and and ultimately killed them. Now with modern day antibiotics, um, if we were exposed to certain things like that, we would just give antibiotics and that person would be saved. And we give them clean water. Yeah. Sure, Back sure. then, you, you you couldn't rehydrate them because they didn't have clean water. So you give them more water and they'd get sicker. And that's what happens in third world countries still to this day. So I think the, you know, the 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 premise that, you know, we shouldn't be exposing people because that's you know, because, you know, look at what the unsanitary conditions is what killed people years ago. Yes, that is true. But because we do have a clean water supply and because we do have still modern day antibiotics. And another thing is, too, is nutrition. So, yeah, yeah. You know, 200 years ago, I mean, it, you were lucky to have enough nutrients to live, you know, and now we have an overabundance. Most every American has access to an overabundance of nutrition. And that's why obesity is, is an epidemic in this country. Um, so that's another issue too. So, um, you know, I think if, if there, there, there's a balance for sure. And I, and I definitely, i believe me, I promote clean water and modern day sanitation. <laughs> I really believe in that. Um, but maybe like what you're talking about and that Jan's talking about raw milk, raw eggs, th- those things aren't that bad. And thinking of the leaky gut, going back to the leaky gut thing, you know, when I think about my chemistry background, my biochemistry background, and you're talking about proteins. I mean, in theory, there should be no protein that gets through our, by design, mm-hmm. there should be no protein, none that gets, proteins are not that stable of a molecule. They, they, they're not very stable in acid. They're not stable in heat. You know, they, they, they break down in heat. They break down in acid. So, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm sure some of them are, don't like, uh, uh, our stomachs are acidic. Our intestinal tract is basic. I'm sure some of them don't like that basic pH of, you know, 12, 11, 12, 13, 14. So in theory, there should be no protein that gets through our intestinal tract. Right. I mean, none. Maybe some pieces of them, some some you know amino acids or things like that, but not a full protein by any means. So, and we do know that proteins are very antigenic. So, if that is what's causing a lot of these intolerances, sensitivities, allergies, it's a gut issue. Yep. Well, <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. yeah. No, I actually, that's a. I never. I didn't even. I go, I don't know if it's I didn't know that stuff or I just wouldn't have thought about that. So that's really interesting that you're bringing in that biochemistry background to this because that's what I was talking about before when I said, you know, there's other things going on that precede even the the leaky gut, right? Because by the time we get there, there's other things that have gone wrong. Um, a lot of people, you know, my gosh, these poor people, they'll think they have like acid reflux and their doctor tells them they have too much stomach acid. That is almost never the case and now you get on like a ppi or something and you already had too little now you got even less and so yeah that's the thing and this is why we see a lot of our clients or practitioners even when they're going through the course like myself h pylori other parasites they got it's like how do these things even 
get to an abundance in the body, right? Weren't they supposed to be killed? It's like, that's the thing. Our digestion's so bad that yeah. now these things are making a home and, and things that were never supposed to happen in theory, like you said, are happening. And I think that's a huge thing for the sensitivity. So um, it's crazy. It's crazy to think about, but. Well, I think about some of the, some of the good microbes that are in raw milk and or raw eggs or just, just, just good quality raw food in, in general that could, also help break down, like you talked about probiotics, and you know we supplement very commonly with probiotics or recommend that to our patients. Um, but think, you know, that's something that we've had to do over the last few decades because we don't get it from our food, right? You know, because our food is so sterile. <laughs> so think about the good microbes that are in um, certain foods that can help break down those proteins. Yeah, I think that's why too we need to be a little. Uh, uh, especially if we're at a place now where we're feeling a little better and we're healthy, we need to be a little less scared. Like, you know, when you go, I'm going to the great smoky mountains this weekend with some family and friends. When we go and I'm out there, because I also know, even though glyphosate's unfortunately in the rainwater, a place like that is going to be better than my backyard in Pennsylvania. I promise you that when you're out there hiking, like, you know, we're, we're so big on like wiping our hands off before we touch the snacks that we're eating for hiking. Yeah. I, don't, I just, it sounds so small, but I try not to do that anymore. Like if I'm touching rocks all day or I fell over and I got a little dirt on my hand, I just eat the food how I normally would, because you're getting stuff from the environment. And I'm not saying touching a few rocks and eating with dirty hands is going to save your life, but it, it's these small little things over time, allowing yourself to get exposed the way our ancestors would have been exposed every single waking hour of every single day. Yeah. Um, I think we can at least get closer. And so I, I try to do that when appropriate. So yeah, yeah, it'll be, it's cool. But that's how we can get the probiotics naturally, right? Rather than just the same strains every single day. Although I do supplement with probiotics because for me, I think it's very useful with all the antibiotics I've been on. But I try to add in some natural stuff too, just like going out in nature and, and allowing what's going to happen to happen. Yeah, that, that brings me back to my childhood. We ate out of the garden without ever washing, and it just came <laughs> right out of the dirt, you know? I mean, kids are not worried about it, you know? It's just, oh, that looks good. Let's try it. I wouldn't recommend that now with all the sprays that, they, you know, people are using in their gardens, but, you know, my parents didn't do that. And their fertilizer was their old compost that had old manure in it. So, I mean, imagine all the things that we, you know, and it wasn't fresh stuff. So, I mean, they, they, you know, knew, they knew from all their experience of living, you know, how to do it. But um, yeah, it makes, that's a great point because, you know, as mothers and even in a house, it's like in the past few years, it's like sterilize everything. And, you know, the surfaces of everywhere you go, you're like, huh, look like that got removed. That, Hmm, that looks a little weird now, you know? And so I think to your point, we've gotten to the extreme of, you know, having too much bleach or too much cleaner to the point where nothing normal lives on anything anymore in our homes. And, you know, that's, that's not a, necessarily a good thing because we do need organisms on us and in us to make our food digest properly. Yeah, well, and that, that's the irony of the thing I was talking about before. It's right, like generally speaking, I'm not stereotyping, but those would be the same people that, you know, will happily inject their kid with something, which again, I'm not even arguing against. I don't know enough, but what, we're going to put the bacteria into the kid, but we won't let them get exposed to it. Yeah, that's right. a great point. That, that doesn't yeah, the make same sense. Mechanism that's that makes that work is the same mechanism that. It just yeah. that that's always confusing to me. Like at least right. go with both. Right. At least go with both. I can I can conceptually understand that, but one or the other. Um, especially when it's that one is, is interesting to me. Um, so what's interesting, Janet, you made me think of something when you're talking about getting stuff from the garden, when you go buy organic in the store, it's great. Obviously we know a lot of it's still commercialized and it's not really organic in the way that right. we want it. Um, I thankfully have a health food store, like I said, near me that, um, they do local within a hundred miles. So not perfect, but still better than shipping it all the way across the country. So they get from farmers that they actually know and they drop it off. It's, it's really cool. But even that stuff, as good as it is never compared to this one time I went up to the Catskill mountains and the Catskill mountains, a lot of it's untouched. There's a bunch of state regulations there that you can't like build big business. So it's really, really great land. And we got to go on this organic farm to table tour. So you, you drove around and this, it's really cool. I recommend it if you guys are ever in the Catskills in New York. Bottom line is though, we went to this apple place in October 
And it was kind of, um, it's so funny because it's the stereotype of what everyone thinks organic is when they first get into it. Like, don't they expect like the holes in it, the worms still coming out, right? <laughs> and then you go to the grocery store and they're all polished up nowadays. But no, this was that. He had uh, his crates of apples and, and they did have holes in it. They kind of, they weren't as aesthetically pleasing as you desire, but it was, it was nuts because when everyone bit them, it's like it does something to your brain. Like our brain just knew that this was good. We had 20 people on that retreat that we were on. We ended up having to spend money to buy two crates because everyone, universally, everyone in that group loved them so much and saw such a distinct difference from even the organic stuff that they were eating at the store because a lot of them were into health already. They said, we've never tasted anything like that, neither had I, and we ended up having to get two crates. So if you just think about that, I mean, so many of us were trying to do the right thing and we go to the store and we get like organic or local or whatever. And it's still nothing compared to like what you grew up with, like real from the place, right from the tree lands, never been tainted yet. Like this guy lived in the middle of nowhere, no service, just him and his dog and his apple orchard. It was, it was beautiful, but, um, it just shows you how much different the food is. Cause I thought I was eating healthy already and I tasted his stuff. I'm like, wow, like, okay, even my organic stuff's not touching this. This is crazy. Well, that's one of the things. It's it, it's we're out at a disadvantage because our food has been so. Even our, you know, we call it unprocessed foods has been so processed yeah. <laughs> that you know we're at a disadvantage. Disadvantage because it's um, you know, it's just difficult to get that stuff in a store. Now, that doesn't mean that you still still can't do your best. And I still think that you know without going to the Catskills mountains, you can still <laughs> for the most part, you know, um, eat a, a, a decent diet. At least you can always do better. You know, that that's one of the things and talking about food sensitivities, you know, if you find out that you have a food, you know, do a food sensitivity test. And if you find out that you are sensitive to something, eliminate it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's going to be a start, you know, right. Right. And, well, and I think the biggest indicator, and this is where all the other labs come in, I, I know we're not here to touch on that today, but this is a loaded conversation in and of itself. But if you, more importantly, is if you test for the food sensitivities, you remove that food and you notice you feel better, that is a little bit of a nice warning sign. And it's a warning sign that you need to heal something because really, even if you're reacting immunologically, you shouldn't, as we talked about today, you really shouldn't ever be getting that protein into your bloodstream for the immune response to happen. Right. So remember, when we take a, um, a food sensitivity test, this one in particular, you take three blood vials out of the person's arm. So we're directly exposing the blood to the protein. But just because you consume that food, in theory, does not actually mean that the protein ever got to the bloodstream. So something, that's what these people are talking about when they say that food sensitivity tests don't matter. They're talking about, we can fix this and it leads to the food sensitivity not mattering. I agree. So then use the food sensitivity test as a nice way to feel a little better temporarily, but also as a warning sign. Like the best thing you okay. could ever have happen is run something like an MRT food sensitivity test, remove the foods that are on there and still feel the same way. If you still feel the same way, it means that that's probably not a huge issue for you because that test, again, nowleap.com is their website. Uh, that test is phenomenal with being highly correlated with symptoms that people are experiencing. So um, just check that out and, and yeah, use it correctly. It's not the only test. It's not a one size fits all. It's something that's meant to be used in conjunction with other healing modalities while you're fixing up your whole body. I love it. This has been great, Evan. I appreciate you being on today and educating us about food sensitivities. As we wrap this podcast up, tell our listeners and viewers the best way to get a hold of you. Sure. At FDN, like Functional Diagnostic Nutrition, at FDN Training on um, Instagram. That's actually really the best way. We have real people that monitor the account. We don't do the bot thing on there. We do it other places, but not there. And so you can DM us and just say, hey, like, what's up? I want to talk to Ev. You could say you want to talk to anyone. Um, and I hop on there and so do others. So that's just kind of the easiest way. And then if you ever want to check out our podcast, feel free. It's called The Health Detective Podcast by Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. Um, every podcast has a little bit of a different format. So it's kind of cool. I don't look at any of us as being in competition. Um, in fact, they work together, you know, because you'll get something from ours that you can't get here and vice versa. So I'm just really grateful for the uh, privilege of being able to come on twice in one week. I love it. Yeah. Janet, what comments do you oh, have for you? Man, for, I could be here all day. It's very <laughs> fascinating. My, my brain is ticking through some of the clients that I have. So um, 
You mentioned some testing. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming I'm going to get some questions as to how to go about this. So talk to me a little bit about that so our viewers would understand how they would go about being tested. Sure. So, I mean, the MRT is something that you can buy online. Um, I will be honest. It, it's really upcharged. So if you were going to like, if you were really dedicated to just doing the MRT today and you're not going to listen and not do the other tests, at least reach out to us at FDN training or something or um, shameless plug. I don't think FDN would mind this. I have a business called Bucks County Light Therapy. So that's at Bucks County Light Therapy on Instagram. Um, if you wanted to reach out there, please let us know that you heard us from this podcast so that we can make sure that we're working with um, Sean and Janet properly. But when you go on Google and try to search for the MRT, it's like $700 for the test without a console. We absolutely can give a better price than that. Good to know. All right. Thank you for all your information today. I really appreciate it, Evan. Let's stay in touch because there's lots of subjects we could talk about. Well, you'll be on ours soon. So yeah, I'm looking forward. That's to right. It. All right. And I'm looking forward to it. So thank you so much. Yeah. Listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Tune into our regularly scheduled podcast Monday, 1230 to 130 Pacific Standard Time. We will see you then. Thank you.